Warmest greetings to all in the blessed name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now, I'm sure that it is the desire of every Christian here to be more and more sanctified, more and more holy, more and more like the image of Christ, more and more pleasing to God, walking closer and closer to Him. I'm sure that is our desire. But there is often one very big barrier to that, a big hurdle that unless we overcome it, we will not progress. We will not grow to the next stage of holiness. What is that? Well, you see from the title, and I think you will already guess it. The way we respond, the way we respond to God's chastisement, God's instructions, God's corrections in our life will determine whether we will grow or we will continue in our current state of disobedience and eventually, like Eli, reach a stage where we will face judgment. Yes, there is judgment for the believers. Not that the judgment is to judge you and send you to hell. If you're a true believer, your salvation is sure. But there will be consequences. God will chastise and chastise. Then eventually when we refuse to repent, to grow, to respond, then sometimes the final straw will come. Just like parents, you know that. You do that. You give warnings after warnings. Your aim is that the child may improve, but they would not. Then you say, then this is it. This privilege will be permanently taken away, for example, right? So your growth, my growth, is very dependent, my friends, on how sincere, how honest we are towards how we respond towards God's act in our lives when we sin. Turn with me to your Bibles, to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 3. Now, we want to draw as much as possible from this chapter before we move on to chapter 4. Now, here you know the story you've been following. Eli, God says, knew his sin. Right? Now, if you look at verse, um, verse 11, God says, I will do something that is very great. In other words, his, his judgment on Eli. Now then, God says in verse 12, I will perform against Eli all the things which I have spoken concerning his house, and I will bring it to an end. God will act. And then finally he says in verse 13, For I have told him. I have told him. Has not God told us many times? How have we been responding? Verse 13 again. I will judge his house forever. You see, the final judgment will come. And then, for the iniquity which he knoweth. We studied that last week. Which he knoweth. When we know and we refuse to respond as we ought to, we will never grow. Well, we will never grow is serious enough. But what is worse than that, God says, I will do something that will cause Israel, I will do something that will cause those around us to know. Why? so that they will not sin the sin that we continue in, right? So, now, we come to verse 17, all right, verse 17. Eli insisted that Samuel reveal to him everything that God has told him. I think at this stage, Eli may not be expecting that what God revealed to Samuel was about him and his final judgment. But look at how Eli responded. Look at verse 18. And Samuel told him every wit and hid nothing from him. Now, meaning to say that every single detail of God's judgment upon Eli, his children, his line, his house, his, his, his place as a priest and his children's place as the priest are permanently removed. All, every single detail was told to him. Now, how would we respond when we hear all the very severe, painful, frightening detail told to us. How would we respond? Let's see, let's learn from Eli in verse 18. Look at verse 18. 
What did Eli say? It is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. Three parts in his response. It is the Lord. Number one. Number two, let him do. Number three, what seemeth good to him. We want to learn from these three parts. How should we respond ourselves? Excuse me for a second. Now, the first, Christian, when we receive this kind of rebuke, yes, it may be sometimes too late. Judgment is past. Maybe in school, maybe at home, maybe even in the church, and hopefully never in society, right? It means that we have committed a crime, and now we are going to mar our testimony for God. Now, sometimes there comes a time where a judgment, a sentence is passed. A discipline is executed, whether in the home or in the church even. How are we going to respond? Now, Eli, the first thing he say, it is the Lord. What does it mean when, when we say it is the Lord? Now, he used the covenantal name of God. He did not say it is God, but the Lord. Look at verse 17. Now he will say, What did the Lord say unto thee? I pray he did not from me. God do so to thee. He knows the difference between Elohim and Jehovah. He was using very specifically now, after hearing the judgment, it is the covenantal Lord. Now what does it mean? The covenantal Lord is faithful. Faithful and he remembers. God says, blessings for obedience. Cursings. For disobedience. Destisements will come. Now God in His covenant say, if you obey me, you follow my ways. You will receive blessing. I will bless you because I will use you. I bless you because you will be useful. Not because God bless you for your own pleasure. I promise to be with you. Like the covenantal promise that the parents made today. I promise to bless you. Claim the covenantal promise. But Israel always remembered also, the Lord is also faithful to chastise them. You disobey, I will also keep my promise to you. I will chastise you. Why? To draw you back. Why? Because my name is, 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 is being attacked. Why? Because my work must go forward. So I will do what is needed to stop you. So when he says the Lord, he is saying this. Well, I understand. God is the one that is acting. The covenantal Lord is now acting based on His covenantal promise. Now, let me ask you today, when you receive a sentence from your parents, all right, young ones, I've told you many times, now this is it. This privilege permanently taken away. You will never use whatever the computer or whatever thing it is, all right? Never again. This is done. Or maybe one day, there's a church discipline on you or your child in the church. How are you going to respond? You say, it is my parents. <laughs> Very often that. You go to school, you tell your friends, my parents. Or you say, well, the church is very unloving. Well, the church is so mean. Why must they do this? You see, God says, Eli knew. Eli knew. Means that in the heart, you know, child. You know, worshipper. You have done that. Repeatedly would not change. Repeatedly told would not change. And finally, something will have to be done. How would you respond? The first response we must learn is it is the Lord. God is the one. The Lord is the one. It is not my parents. I have done that. I refuse to admit. I refuse to change. And now I have to face that. It is the Lord. It is, it is the church, the, not it is the pastor, it's not it's the church that exercises church discipline. Now, I hope we never have to do that. But when we have to, we have to. Just like here, God did not appear to Eli directly. God sent Samuel. You have to know that. God doesn't necessarily always speak to you directly through your devotion. And sometimes God does, but again and again, you ignore it. It comes to a point where God will send sometimes the preacher, the church, 
your parents, sometimes even unbelievers, to execute his judgment. God used even the unbelievers to execute judgment on Israel many times when Israel repeatedly refused. So God will send people. Don't always think that God will speak to you directly. It comes to a point where you must see that it is the Lord. God is now, the Lord is the one that is acting. Now don't, you know the world says, don't shoot the messenger, right? We get angry at the messenger. We get angry at parents. We get angry at church. We get angry at the pastor. We get angry at our teacher. We get angry at authorities. So learn from Eli. It is the Lord. So it is the Lord. The first thing is the Lord is the one that's acting through this means, through this circumstance even. Sometimes it is through circumstances. Don't blame the angry at the circumstance. Ah, this person, if this person, only this person didn't do this, didn't make this mistake, I won't be in this situation. Learn to say it is the Lord. Now, I told you before, I was, when I was uh, doing my final year project, I, I was doing uh, semiconductors um, um, as my final year project. So I have to grow a wafer, a semiconductor wafer, all right? And that cost thousands of dollars, thousands of pounds um, in, in um, UK currency, all right? So thousands of pounds, about 5,000 pounds. That is the cost of my one year's tuition fees. I was carrying it, all right? I was carrying it, walking very carefully to, to, the, to the area where I need to place it down. As I was carrying it, I was moving, and then it slipped. It slipped. And everything occurred in slow motion. I still can remember. I see the wafer. Oh, it's moving fast, you know, but it was slow motion to me. Go and then land. And even the shattering was slow motion <laughs> for some reason. It's as if God slowed down everything in my mind to see very clearly. And the very first thought in my mind was not silly lab assistant give me a slippery tweezer. Why must they build this bench so far away from, from, the, fum, uh, from the fumigation area? Why? No, the first thought in my mind, it is the Lord. Because I was disobeying God in something I knew. And I would not want to repent. Delay repentance. When that happened, I knew it is the Lord. Now we must learn more to be like Eli. It is the Lord. I, it, is, it is Him who is working. The second thing, all right? The second part, let him do. Let him do. Now, what does this mean? Let him do. He is basically saying, I accept. I submit. The first one is, it is the Lord that is doing this. The second, let him do. I accept what he is doing. I submit to it. I submit to it. I submit to his discipline. Now, whether it is society, whether it is um, school, church, home, when it happens, and we know in our heart we are guilty, say, I accept. Let him do. The action is coming. The, the, the sentence is passed. It's going to be done. Then kiss the rod of discipline. <laughs> Right? People always say, kiss the rod of discipline. So child, next time the daddy say, I told you many times, and now I have to discipline you. The rod comes up. So you take, kiss the rod. All right, daddy, now you can discipline me so that I will learn my lesson and stop doing this. Thank you. All right? Well, we say, yes, child, please do that. Well, as adults, it's the same for us. I accept. I accept what is to be done. You know, um, oh, I'll come to that later, what we should not do, all right? So let it be done. I de let it be done. That is what it is. Now then, we have the third part. What seemeth good to him? What seemeth good to him? What is that? Now, it means I deserve. I deserve what is dished out to me or what will be dished out to me. I deserve it. God never does anything that is unjust. God never does anything that is, that is sinful. What God does is always good, and therefore, whatever it is, even to be told that my line will be permanently removed and my, my descendants will never be in this line of priesthood anymore, it has shifted, then 
Well, if God says that is what I deserve, that is what is good, right in His eyes, then I deserve it. I deserve it. Now, do we, des- do we respond in this way? Now, you know the story in 2 Samuel chapter 16. 2 Samuel chapter 16, right? Now, David knew that all his sins were catching up. The consequences were catching up. He would refuse, all right? He knows what to do, but he disobeyed God time and again in several things. Then eventually, his children will rise up to try and kill him, to take his throne. He had to run. He had to escape. And remember that when this man that um, would take stones and take dust and keep throwing at David and kept cursing him. And then this servant of Abishai said, well, you know, how dare this person do this to the king? What was David's response? He said, let him alone. Because Abishai said, let, let me go and go and take this man down. You know, you know this man that were with David, they were, they were very, very great soldiers, right? Very great um, um, soldiers. So he said, let me take him down. And David simply says, well, let him alone. Let him curse. The Lord hath biddeth him. You see, that is the heart that we should have. Let him, let him do that. The Lord hath bid. And then he says this, it may be that the Lord will take, will look on mine affliction and that the Lord will requite me, requite me for this cursing this day. See how submissive he is to such a terrible um, consequence? He is a king. He's been king for some time. And this person would treat him like a dog in Israel. So are we like that? That is what we should learn. That is the good response. Children, are you like that? Adults, are we like that? Learn to be like that. Now, of course, the best is, is not to reach this stage. All right? Eli had to reach this stage. But my point is this. At every stage when God chastises, respond this way. That's the best before, before it reaches judgment. Before it reaches judgment. In other words, is this, my friends. Acknowledgement is not good enough. We must act. We must act. God says Eli knew. And the way Eli responded now, in a sense, probably reflects probably what his heart was all the while. I know, I know. But Eli would not act. If Eli acted earlier as he should, restrain himself, restrain his children, he would not reach this stage. So please, Please respond rightly and the best response in the end is to act on the sin and stop and stop. So that is the good response we should learn. But I want to move further. Then to ask ourselves, when we don't respond like that, what are the other responses we can have? What are the other responses that we can have? Well, the first one, I call it the self-deception response. The self-deception response. Because we can also, all right, when we are facing chastisements from God, we are facing all these consequences coming to us or already in our lives, we can say like Eli. We can say like Eli, it is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth good. Then we sound very holy, sound very right, sound very righteous. Wow, you know, wow. Very admirable. But there can be self-deception, meaning to say we mean different things. And it can often be a very common response. I've heard this many times, I'm sure, as you have. Some Christians going through obvious um, um, chastisements of God, and even when judgment occurs, they say, well, it is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth good to him. Say it in a very um, holy way. But what do we mean? What can we mean? We can mean this. It is the Lord, meaning to say, He is sovereign. Right? He's the Lord. He's the sovereign Lord. What He wants to do, uh, let Him do. So because He is sovereign, 
then let him do whatever he wishes to do. It is his prerogative. We studied that. Sovereign means he answers to no man. Sovereign means he does not seek advice or, or counsel from men. He does as he wishes. So let him do. Let him do. He's sovereign, so he can do what he chooses. And then the third one, what seemeth good to him. What we mean is, well, you know, God knows best. God knows the future. All things work together for good. So he said, oh, this is just working out. God is working out something good in my life. We self-deceive ourselves that instead of when judgment comes, we attribute it. We attribute the outcome to the sovereignty of God when it is our failure. Judgment, instead you say, sovereignty of God, right? Now, that is a very dangerous response. It is not uncommon, and I hope that we do not self-deceive ourselves by responding like that. Search our hearts. Is there something? Is there something you've already known for years? You keep hearing from when you read the Bible, when you take FEBC courses from the pulpit. It comes back again and again. It's God's mercy that He brings again and again to your reminder. Then when the final judgment or when, cons- when judgment chastisements are happening, you don't relate it to your sin, but you relate it to, well, God knows best, so, so let God continue to do this in my life, and then you're suffering. Now, I'm not saying that every suffering, I'm not saying that every um, um, negative so-called event in your life is, is always chastisement, is always judgment. Yeah, sometimes it's the sovereignty of God, but you will know. God says, Eli knew. Eli knew, and I hope you don't know until a stage where you seal your conscience and you really believe is the sovereignty of God. Now, this is the attitude that sometimes we can have. Rather than accept, acknowledge, receive the chastisement, we think, we say it is God's plan for our lives. This is a very dangerous one. Now, what is the problem with this? Instead of responding like Eli, we say this, but we, in our heart, think otherwise. Well, one thing will happen, obviously, is this. The big problem is you will not progress in your Christian walk. We said that. See, the whole problem in our Christian walk is when God says, I am working, we don't want to see it as God is bringing us back and trying to make us walk back on the right path. Instead, we say, these things are fine. And you continue. So in other words, you will continue in your wayward disobedience stubbornly and still think it is not related to that. Now, I want to read to you Hebrews 12, 6. Hebrews 12, 6. You already know what that is. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Do you know what that means? Obviously, God says every child of God whom he loves, and he loves all his children, if you're truly saved, he says he will chasten. Now, do you know why we seldom use the word punish for Christians? Because the Bible uses the word chasten. Chasten. It is a better theological picture. Instead of punish, we often use the word punish, and you see the word punish referring to unbelievers, eternal punishment in hell. All right? Now, chasten, chasten, the word literally means to make you taste. Chase means pure, right? Chaste. So the chastening of God for the believer is always to make you pure. That is why God says, He loves you and He will chasten you. The whole purpose of these things is to make you pure, to help you to grow to the next stage. But as long as you live in this self-deception and prefer this self-deception, so that you can, do, you can ignore thinking about this thing that has been, well, coming again and again to remind you. The chastening won't work because you take it as the sovereignty of God. And God says even scourges, scourging is painful. Every child that he receives. When things become, God will ramp it up. Why? Out of love. Sometimes God sees that we are going to reach judgment. He ramps it up, scourge you. 
whatever it is, situation, health, finances, family, whatever it is, God wrecks it up and you still say, oh, the sovereignty of God, the sovereignty of God. Well, God knows best. Then you do not change. All right, so that is a dangerous approach. And here I want to ask anyone who's been worshipping with us for a long time or any visitor that we frequently have visitors, now, are you truly, are you truly saved? Do you know if you will go to heaven today, if you were to die today, young and old die, whether you will go to heaven? Or will you just live in this um, self-deception? Well, if I'm going to heaven, I'm going to heaven. If I'm not, I'm not. Well, whatever is up to God, right? I can't do anything wrong. God says, come to me now. Ask me to save you and forgive you. Don't resist. Don't reject. Turn away from your sin. God says, I offer you salvation. So it is, it is for you to respond. So don't live in this self-deception. Well, I hope, hope for the best and then don't think about this. Push it aside. It is foolish. It is foolish because the judgment will come eventually. So God, out of His love, also says, come, come. Sometimes God may even bring very painful things in life. Why do you want to wait till then? It may not reach that for your case. Yesterday we were talking at Seniors Fellowship, how someone shared um, the, the relative always rejected, 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 don't want to think about it, ignore, reject. And then finally, well, God in His mercy sent a very serious illness. Then the person began to think, yes, I can die tomorrow. This thing can suddenly happen. Humble himself and receive God and ask God to save him. Right? So, don't live in this deception, my friend. And then there is another deception, all right, which we roughly talked about last week. Not only you say, well, it's the sovereignty of God, all things work together for good, and you keep ignoring instead of, of submitting and admitting. Well, you say, well, no one is perfect. Heard of that? No one is perfect, right? No one is perfect. So, um, well, you know, these things happen. Well, I'm not perfect. It is, again, a very dangerous and foolish way to think. You know, one of the problem in Eli's, well, obviously in this context, is Eli's upbringing of his children. God made it very clear. We don't have to guess what is the problem. God made it very clear in chapter 2, you honor your sons more than me. You despise me. He made it very clear. All right? Honor us thy sons above me. Chapter 2, verse 29. That is clear. The way he brought up his children was the problem. No second thing thought about that. Now, parents, don't be so foolish to say, well, uh, no one can be a perfect parent. Well, um, well whether the child will, will walk in God's way or not is up to God. Well, to some extent, it may be true, but this is one instance that we have to learn. If you have failed, if you set your own lifestyle as your standard, well, you know, whatever the standard, I, I don't care. This is my concept of Christianity. This is my concept of how to live, how I bring up children. This is good enough. More than this is extreme and so on. Well, the rest is really up to God. Don't be so foolish to think that, well, when your children grow up, all will still be well when they go wayward, when they cause you heartache, when they cause you pain, when they break up the family, when they break up their own family, when they are terror to society, well, don't say, well, it's up to the Lord. You will be accountable. Eli was made clearly accountable because in verse 13 of chapter 3, for I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth. Number one, he knows. Number two, because his sons made themselves vow. Well, is it the son's fault? No, God made it clear. Yes, the children made himself vow, but God says in verse 13, and he restrained them not. Don't let your child, a child don't understand. Let them do whatever they want. You are to restrain. So parents, please be very clear about this. Now, even for, for well, non-parenting, uh, well, in your singlehood walk, in your whatever it is in your life. Now, don't live under this, this self-deception to say, well, it's not my fault. 
It's not my fault. You know, one of the big problems that we have in church today and for the future of the church is no godly seed. Many seed, but will the seed be godly? Someone commented, somehow God gave BBCWA many boys, right? More and more babies, many of them boys. So what? So what? What kind of boys will they grow up to be? What kind of leaders will they grow up to be? It all depends on whether you honestly admit the way I have been living is fake. How I've been thinking is to excuse how I live before my child. I'm not perfect. Yes, no one is perfect. But we all strive. There's a big difference. Striving to be obedient. We will fall. Yes, we are not perfect. There's a big difference between that and excusing ourselves. What will the church have in the future? God will hold you accountable. Like God held Eli accountable. Uh, don't know, Pastor, you don't understand my child is different. Can your child be worse than Eli's children? You read about what they do. Can your child be worse than that? But God still say you could have restraint. You could have restraint. Now I want you to notice um, um, something that is... Um, interesting, all right? Now, if you um, turn to chapter 2. Turn to chapter 2. Verse 25. Chapter 2, verse 25. Now, it says, if one sin against another. So, he was, he was so-called tapping his children on the wrist. If, any, if one sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat him, entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of the high priest. No, unto their father. Unto the voice of their father. Now here God reveals that Eli's failure was not simply the failure of the high priest. He was wearing two hats. We know that. One hat is the high priest rebuking his, the priest under him. The other head, he is the father. And here God make it clear, he did not respond to the voice of the father, not the high priest. So father, God holds you accountable for them. So don't give those excuses, all right? Yes, yes, God is sovereign, yes. Salvation belongeth to the Lord, yes. But be very honest, don't have this self-deception. Now, then the third one, all right? The third one. This one of the worst. All right? The worst. And that is the refusal to acknowledge. The refusal to acknowledge. Do you admit? Do you admit? Well, Eli just simply say, it is the Lord. And he admitted, I deserve it. Do you admit? Now, when you would not receive the sentence passed, the judgment passed. When you reject, say, what? Who? Who said that? What do you mean? Right? I want to say again, God sent Eli. God sent Samuel. God sent Samuel. How would you feel a young lad come to you and correct you? Right? So, just say at home, your teenage son or daughter, correct you, who is senior, right? Older, much older. How would you respond? How dare you speak like that? How dare you tell me these things? Go away. How would you respond? The church leaders as well. How would we respond? Will we refuse to acknowledge? You have no right to tell me that. Now, before the young ones get too excited, huh? I'm going to go around and correct all the seniors. The question is, how would you respond? Now, you know how society is today? The rejection of correction. The refusal to acknowledge. How many times you read, even in Australia, right? Politicians, even in, in many countries, I don't know whether it happened in our countries, um, traffic police, head of traffic police, all right? They stopped they were stopped in the traffic, um, um, in the traffic stop 
for, for breaking um, the, the laws. And because they feel that they are in that position, they just refuse to acknowledge. They argue. They fight. Now you have sovereign citizens, right? I'm above the law. So the attitude in society now is one of, I refuse to admit. In fact, the moment I admit, I'm wrong, right? So the rejection of that. Are we learning that attitude as well? Parents, are you? You hear messages and say, no, right? You hear correction from the Bible as you do your vision, no. You refuse. You refuse to acknowledge that that is what is happening in your life, your failures, your, your false living, your refusal to choose that which is the best. You say, my standard is good enough. Are we learning from society? Too proud to admit. We learned on Friday, one of the signs of pride is refusal to submit to God. When God brings all this, how will you submit? So now when you think of all this, one of the, why, now this is a very um, terrible state compared to Eli, but what is, what is the danger of this, all right? What is, what is the outcome of this? Remember, 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 God's judgment, God's chastisements to you is to chasten you, is to make you a better Christian. So when you refuse, not no longer about this self-deception, now you just simply outrightly reject. Let me ask you what will happen. Well, we've seen this again and again in churches. Well, in the home as well, right? Between husband and wives, between parents and children. Now what will you do? You will begin to play politics, right? You will begin to play politics or even gaslight. Now, when you refuse, I give you an example, which is King Saul. King Saul, which we'll later learn. King Saul, because of his sin, was removed. He was again and again given a chance, but he would not respond to the chastening. He came to the point where God says to Samuel, tell him he's removed. Please remember, God told Samuel, so, so, so Saul had to receive it from Samuel. You are removed from king. Wow, you prophet me king. You remove me? Now, he would not respond. And finally, well, he reached a stage where God said, you will be removed. And he died a horrible, a horrible death. But throughout, the thing is this. What was his response when he continued to, to refuse to acknowledge it is his sin and receive it and repent? He began to politic against David, right? He f continuously find, found a way to, how, how can I get rid of David? How can I kill David? He will even want to kill his own son to get rid of David. This will, you will reach that state, my friend. It's very, very scary, that state. For example, right? Spouse, arguments. You know you are wrong, but you refuse to admit. You reject. The counselling, and you continue, and you continue. Whatever your husband or wife does, you say, you, you see, you see, and you keep finding ways to get back at the person. Now it can happen in church, very common as well. I've seen church discipline in churches. No one likes to exercise church discipline. There is a huge step before an elder or a church member is disciplined. There are many chances, please know that, you studied that with us. But when that happens, I've seen even church elders, they refuse. Well, the church have to execute it. They just say, okay, you execute, you execute. But I, I don't agree. I don't agree that, I've done, that what I've done is wrong and continue to do it. And what they do is they go around and it could be ordinary members as well. You go around and try to get people on your side because you will not acknowledge. You acknowledge means you are wrong. You try to convince others, you spin stories and tell people, well, you know, it's because of this, you spin stories. And then you bring people to your side. Please know you are digging your own judgment deeper and deeper. Please know that. You are going to crash your own life. That is what happened when, when Eli refused again and again, all right? So Eli, at least he, he admitted. But you will be like Saul. Don't do that. Because in our minds, I must find people that agree with me that I, am, I was not wrong and the church is wrong. 
you will begin to do that because you won't admit, you won't acknowledge. King Saul was like that. That is the behavior that will result when we do not follow Eli's behavior. The opposite behavior will take over. Naturally, naturally. What other acts would you take? Right? So, now young ones at home, when you get chastised, be honest. Of course, if it is very true that you did not do it, all right, explain, but be honest. Be honest. And when the judgment is passed, accept it. Don't go around and retaliate. It is not good for us. God does all this. I want to emphasize this again and again. God does all this to help us get out of his chastisement as soon as possible and then grow spiritually. That is why God does these things. Receive these things in that light. Husband and wife, when you quarrel, somewhere in your heart, you know that your wife or your husband is correct, but you want to gaslight, you want to, you want to cook up some story to make the other person feel like he or she is wrong. And after that, you have to maintain that, right? Don't do that. But when you take it as God, you send me a help in my marriage. It's to help me become spiritually better. Always take that kind of correction in that mode. You know what? When you say it is the Lord, thank God that He sent my wife or my parents or my children or my church to let me know these things. It is the Lord. When you see beyond the person, you see the Lord. Let Him do. I thank God that at least God is working. He's chastening me. At least I know I'm His child. What seemeth good? This is always for my good. Always for my good. Then you will change. You will improve. Right? Whether it's children, whether it's parents, whether it's worshippers, whether it's church leaders. That is the whole point. So responding rightly to God's judgment is very, very important for our spiritual growth. See beyond the person. See beyond the church. Now, if you don't, you will go round and round and round and you live years in misery just waiting for opportunity to get back at the person or your parents or your spouse or your church. That is what's going to happen. And then you will live in this great delusion and really crash your life. That is not the intention of God. The best is always, is always to respond quickly. Now, then the last one, and we end. The last one. Now, this is the dangerous response, all right? The dangerous one. Now, what is it? Now, this is the response where even when you are warned, even when some things have already happened, our response is, well, God won't do anything. God won't do anything. I said in the previous week, God is love, yes. Yes. God is long-suffering, yes. God is patient, yes. But we see here, God gave Eli ten decades to change, but he will eventually catch up. God will not let it continue. Now, so sometimes we feel God will not do anything, but if you are Eli, and if you respond wrongly, all right, thank God Eli respond rightly, what is the other response? I am serving for tens of years, you know? Serving for tens of years. I even... I even help Samuel. Sometimes we think that just because we are serving, we are, we are busy in the Lord's work, God will not do anything. Or when we are doing that, we have this thing that God is sovereign and all that kind of thoughts. Now again, we've seen this in a ministry again and again. Parents will not restrain. They are very active in serving God. They, are, they appear outwardly very godly and all. Do a lot. But eventually, it catches up. Eventually, it catches up. Very severe, very sad outcome for the child and for the family. Doesn't mean that you are doing a lot. God will not act. All right? This is a very dangerous response in our heart, subconsciously. The other dangerous response is, God needs me. God cannot remove me. All right? Eli can feel that way. I'm, I'm the high priest. If God removes me, who is going to be a high priest for the whole nation? I am indispensable. Well, sometimes the pastor can feel that way. It's dangerous. 
God can always replace us. So, well, well I'm a church leader or I'm in charge of this ministry. If, if God removes me, who's going to do it? If God removes me, who's going to take care of my children? I can continue in this. God won't remove me. Well, we said no one is perfect. There's another dangerous one. Or the last one. But others are also living like that. Others are also, are the pastors, are the worshippers, are the Christians. Nothing happened to them. There are people who again and again and again, even church elders, again and again been told, been warned, been taught. Yeah, nothing will happen to me. Even encourage others to follow their sin. And God removes. Just a matter of time. All right, so I hope that with all this, we keep remembering what Eli's response meant. And I just want to remind us, it is the Lord, means God, the Lord is the one who is acting. Don't look at it as people, as the church, as your parents, as your spouse, the Lord. Number two, let him do, means I accept, I submit to what is being done. Number three, not just I accept, I won't fight. I won't say that this is too much. I will say I deserve. In other words, what seemeth him good? I deserve it. Whatever it is that he has decided, I deserve it. Learn that response. Let us rise to sing the closing hymn. 421. Four to one, shall we rise? 421. Have thine own way, Lord. Let God search us and let us respond. 421.